Hey, good morning again. How are we doing today? Hey Amen. It's good to see some of the familiar faces and a lot of new faces that I don't recognize, but I'm, I'm glad to be able to make your acquaintance. Amen. So this morning, you know, we, we spoke about being Vision Sunday, and um, a lot of times, you know, you, you know, people expect you to pull a cat out of the bag and find something new and something exciting and something new, but... You know, last year I was here in, um, during the, the uh, God Thing Conference, and um, during the God Thing Conference, one of the messages I brought after the God Thing Conference was finding focus in 2020. And um, the thing that has really been disturbing me, and, and it's not just necessary I'm talking about, yeah, I'm talking about the body of Christ, is that the body of Christ has lost its focus as to why we gather as a church and what we're supposed to do as a church. Um, and so we've kind of moved away and it's become a lot like the book um, or a lot like the church in Thyatira where Thyatira was, um, what had happened is that a prophetess by the name of Jezebel had entered in and it brought a, 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 a teaching, a demonic teaching in where it kind of permitted the body of Christ to fornicate and do all kinds of things and saw nothing wrong with what they were doing and this alternative lifestyle because, hey, you know, everything seem to be rosy, but God says, I gave them a time to repent. I gave them a, a time to turn around, and I gave them time, and he says, but I'm bringing my judgment in. And to a large degree, we're beginning to see God is beginning to move things in the body of Christ, and we're going to be surprised at some of the things. And that's what I love about Carmel, is that we love the presence of God, and we love the Word of God, because those are the two things that will keep you safe in the plan and purposes of God. And so um, while waiting upon the Lord, uh, God took me, and we're going to go through some of the scriptures that God took me um, to uh, regarding uh, 2020. And so, you know, one of the things that I've learned about God is God never measures success by achievement. He measures success by obedience. And so if we are not obeying the instructions that God had given us or has given us, and we are not walking in the fullness, you know, he's not going to give you a new instruction. It's just the other day I was talking to somebody and uh, we, were, we were, in fact, it was this week, just this week, uh, an, a, a graduate of a Bible school back in Africa many years ago. And um, he left the same time as we left um, you know, we came over to the United Kingdom in 1995. If you don't know our history, God spoke to us in 93. In 1995, um, uh, God opened the door, an opportunity, and we came to, um, and, and we were led to Bristol. God spoke very clearly. He says, go to Bristol. And so we came to Bristol. That was in 95. In 96, we started the church. And in March 1997, God gave us the 20-year plan for the vision of Carmel which was, and many of you know this, has covered our city, bless our neighbors, sent to the nation and touch the world, and gave us a discipling process which was share, care, prepare, and dare, and to be able to become an equipping center. And so that's what we've been doing, and that's what we'll continue to do, because God hasn't changed the plan of what he has ordained for our life. And so we see that, and, but in the meantime, uh, in, uh, uh, God has taken us on a, on a new journey, um, and not a different journey, just a new journey uh, to Houston. And we started, we went there in, in 2015, and, and uh, you'll see some of the recent, in 2017, um, we became legal to be able to actually work in the United States, or I became legal to work in the United States and do the church over there. So it's been an exciting journey. Um, but I said all that to come back to, you know, and we've just seen over the years how God has done things. And, uh, and because this new shift came in in 2017, the shift came in, we saw some things beginning to take place. And um, a lot of has changed. And, uh, you know, the change is uncomfortable. How many of you know that? But change is always good because God never leaves anything. You know, uh, we always say that a movement becomes a monument, becomes a museum, and eventually becomes a mausoleum. 
you know, where there is house dead man's bones. And we never want to do that. We want to continually move with the Spirit of God. But if we are not obeying the Word of God when God is instructing us, He's not going to give you a new instruction. So I don't want to wait 25 years to do what God told me to do. I don't know about you, but I, you know, 25 years, <laughs> yes, time I'll be, and anyway, <clears throat> we'll just leave it at that. Amen. And so uh, a lot of the things that have been happening here has uh, kind of been, a, a, to some degree, a distraction for us, that side, because at times we want to come back and rescue it. And God says, no, you don't rescue. It's not your church. It's my church. And he says, and I've put gifts in this church that will sustain it and keep it and bring it to where it needs to do. All I require of you is to come as the apostolic oversight and stir it up every now and then. So that's my job is to come and stir it up every now and then and get people on fire and full of the passion of God to see about his kingdom come and his will be done. Amen. And so I brought a message um, in, in November calling Finding Focus. And so the, the, the clarity of what God wants for us this year is to find the focus and keep the focus firmly fixed upon him because that's what has happened over the years. We have become distracted looking for solutions, looking for programs, looking for everything else except looking for and seeking the presence of God. Are you with me? So um, you can put the first slide up. Finding focus in 2020. I don't know if it's going to work, but anyway. There it is, finding focus in 20. And that's an eye chart. And if some of you don't know what an eye chart is, that's when you go and you go and get your eyes tested. And uh, you have 20 20 vision. So, in other words, when you stand at 20 feet, you should see certain line or figures. And that gives you what they call 20 20 vision. And it's interesting that we're in 20 20 vision. And so. The important thing is, and I, re- I think I read this to you in October last year, is what's the prophet saying for 2020? So Dr. Kenneth Copeland's word for 2020 was this, and this is part of it. It says, and it will be a year of great change, wonderful and magnificent changes in the kingdom of God in the earth. And I do believe that. Changes are coming. Changes that will become come because of insight, ideas, concepts directly from Jesus to his church by his mighty spirit. Glorious concepts of how his law works. The laws governing increase in financial prosperity. The laws of the spirit that releases miracles and divine healing. Manifestations of his mighty power in the earth. New concepts of his love. His very person for he is love, insight, and true power and strength of his joy. Um, What some of the others are saying, this is um, the next slide, Pastor Happy Caldwell said this, we are in a time when the church is going to be touched by revival in the world. He says, God is going to take us where we have never been before and work through us like we've never experienced before. I do believe we we are on, I was walked into a... Some, uh, where's um, Charmaine was busy talking to Nigel and Rian this morning, and she said, there's a shift coming, and I said, who told you there's a shift coming? Because it's uh, the Spirit of God. Why? Because the Spirit of God is saying this, this is something new. There is revival coming to the church. You better believe it with all your heart. Don't be found wanting. Be part of what God wants to do. Elana Vasa, and she, she did a, a tremendously long prophecy, and I'm going to talk on that tonight. Because tonight I want to speak about activating your faith. Because you're going to need, you get into trouble through your mouth, and you get out of trouble through your mouth. And how you've got to activate your faith in the power of prayer and confession is vital for your life. And if you want to know tonight, don't miss tonight. It will change your life. Amen. And so Lana Vasa says this in 2020, she says, there's going to be multiple beginnings and birthings. We have entered into a new era, a new beginning, and in 20, there is going to be a dawning, a rising, a launching, an unfolding, an opening that is going to take place like never before. Now, you know... For me, it is important to hear what the the prophets are saying, the seers are saying, because a seer is somebody that speaks into your future. 
Do you understand? He sears somebody that is declaring the vision and the image of God pertaining to your future. A lot of us, we, we, we move and we do things based upon emotions and feelings and circumstances. But never on the word of the Lord. And so for me, if God doesn't speak a word, I listen to what the prophets are saying. And then I begin to apply what the prophets are saying in my life to bring about the desired result that God desires for. Not only for my life, but ministry, church, family, whatever it is. So what do you see for 2020? Because that's the key. You know, everybody wants to know what I'm seeing, but what do you see for 2020? In uh, Jeremiah, you can go to the next slide. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 11, 12, the Lord says, The word of the Lord came to me saying, What do you see, Jeremiah? So my question is, what do you see? What are you anticipating? What are you believing for? You know, so often we want to run and we just want to do what everybody else is doing. But what is God saying to you directly? And he says, and I said, I see the rod of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. This is one of the scriptures that God gave me for 2020. What do you see, Jerry? I said, wow, Lord. And that's when he began to take me back on a journey and began to remind me of our responsibility that is given us, that we somehow have always looking for something new and not abiding with what he is requires of us to do. And that's why we become easily distracted and, and led astray. Yep. Amen. He says, what do you see? You have seen well, for I'm watching over my word to perform it. So in other words, when God gives us an instruction in 2017, God spoke to us about community. 2018, he spoke about jubilee, a reset. In 2019, he spoke about momentum. But you know what? In 2020, he says, hey, hang on a second. I've waited for community. I've waited for jubilee. And I've waited for momentum. And if you measure it, and we go back to 28 to 16, 2017... What's happened to the community? What's happened to the reset, the jubilee? What has happened to the momentum? Maybe we need to go back and revisit what God said. Because his church is about community. His body is about community. Common unity around the Son of God. You see, I say this to, often to people. I said, you know, God loves you so much that he will mess with you to perfect his son in you. Because God is, of, is a God of holiness. And he wants to perfect holiness. And if you're not prepared to allow God to perfect holiness in you, you will easily be distracted and go and find something that strokes the flesh instead of resurrects the son in you. Hello? So it's important, he says, and the almond tree is one of the earliest to show life in spring, which is symbolic of new life. So God is saying, I'm birthing new life for Carmel. Amen. I'm bringing, and so, but I want you to get your focus fixed on the reason you are gathered and on the reason that you are together. Because we don't understand, I said earlier, we don't understand what it means to... Be in covenant. We don't understand that meaning, to be in covenant. What does it mean to be in covenant? It means a total commitment to somebody without an expectation for anything in return from them. Jesus said, I call you friend. And then gets down and washes his disciples' feet. And washes the feet of Judas. The same feet that was going to find a pathway to the high priest to betray him. But he washed it. And he served him communion. Do you understand? That is a, the power of covenant. That's the power of our relationships as the body of Christ. 
And we've lacked it because we've, we've made things about our own personal preferences. And we've become prejudiced in what we perceive to be. Oh, well, that's not, and I don't like, and that was too strong, and that was short, and this was that. And we become critical instead of just loving and embracing the very presence of God and be thankful. Well, I don't like him. You know, he smells. He's dirty. This one's that. And this one. Amen. So what are you seeing for 2020? Finding our focus, getting us back into the place where God wants us to be, where faith, where faith begins to once again become the focal point and the demonstration of the power and the presence of God. This is a faith church. It was birthed in faith. It's kept by faith. It prospers through faith. Amen. Faith is what protects it and empowers it. So what do you see for 2020? Here's a visual. We talk talk about 2020 as visual acuity is what we call 2020 vision, which is the ability to see the set object clearly at 20 feet. I shared some of this stuff with you in October. I just want to remind you, visual acuity is dependent on two factors, the optical and the neural factor. The optical being the focus within the eye to receive a light or an image. The neural being the interpretation faculty of the brain to interpret the the vision or interpret that image. So in other words, the brain and the eye works together and the eye receives the light and receives the light of the image. The brain then takes it and translates it and that's when we get an understanding. Well, it's very similar when we look at it in the light of Vision, just as vision is important to see where you are going, so is spiritual vision necessary to guide you on your walk with the Lord. The ability vision requires the same two factors, the ability to see with an eye of faith, the image of what God is showing you. You see, vision is all about where God sees you in your future. You see, when God birthed Carmel for Bristol, he birthed it as a voice in the city and the nation. Amen. Amen. We've been declaring for years that Bristol will be known as the city of faith. I do believe that. Great exploits of faith were done in the city. John Wesley. Just been reading about the revival in the history of John Wesley. But John Wesley was radical. The church did not want him. They kicked him out. But he went and stood on gravestones and preached the gospel. People threw things at him and hated him. But yet he brought revival in this whole Southwest. George Muller housed over 2,000 children by faith alone. Never sent out a newsletter. Am I getting through to you? And we we want to do exploits for God, but we want to do it to know that there's money in the bank or we got people to do it or one thing and another. But God wants you to demonstrate it by faith, by the power of his presence working in your life. We must get back. We must find our focus once again, the plan and purposes of God and why we are here and what is the reason that God is, that has kept us and blessed us and where he wants to take us. Yeah. Yeah. That's why some of the, the aspects of the vision that I believe for 2020 will unfold as the year progresses. Yeah. Amen. Okay. Hello? So... What if there is no vision? Proverbs 20 and 9, 18 says, Where there is no vision, people are unrestrained, but happy is he who keeps the law. In other words, uh, the vision will always drive you closer to the plan and purpose and the image of the Son of God. That's what the whole purpose of the law is. The law is to expose... The law is to establish the righteousness of God, to show the the things lacking in your life and to point you to the solution. Amen? Amen? And so where there is no prophetic revelation of the Son of God in our life, we, we cast off restraints. That's what the, the whole aspect of the Jezebel, um, the prophetess in, the, book of Th- in the, the church of Thyatira. She came in and she brought in a false doctrine. And immediately the people, because they were not abiding in the laws of God and in the truth of God, were easily distracted to run off the things that minister essentially to the emotions and the, and the flesh of individuals. Instead of establishing the power and the presence of God in the life of an individual. Are you out there? 
grieves me when I sometimes, you know, Facebook, and the only reason I use Facebook is to minister. But it grieves me sometimes when I, when I see in, in Facebook what people are doing that is so anti-Christ. But yet they call themselves children of God. I don't judge them. I pray for them. Because we all one decision away of deception. And I recognize that. So easy. One decision away. Thank God for his word and thank God for his grace. The Passion Translation says, when there is no clear clear prophetic uh, vision, people quickly wander astray. But when you follow the revelation of the word, heaven's bliss fills your soul. Amen. So, go with me to Isaiah 43 if you have your Bibles. And, um, and the next slide will show you there what the Lord said in 2017. And so in 2017, while I was busy meditating and, and uh, waiting upon the Lord, um, this scripture, and I wrote in my Bible, given in 2017, and it talks about the past 20 years, and it talks about the next 20 years, because it says there in Isaiah 43, verse 18, Do not call to mind the former things. Or ponder the things of the past. Behold, I will do something new and it will spring forth and you will not be aware of it. And I will make a roadway in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And what was the prophetic word that we received this morning? That there will be rivers of living water. Now, I'm sure... Uh, the person, you know, Gaynor didn't know what the message was this morning, but the Spirit of God was way ahead of us. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Even to the point that I've been meditating on these li- rivers of living water. God, what are you saying? You bring in a freshness. And notice what it says there. And so it says that's the, that was the, the past 20 years. We're not to look at the past 20 years at our accomplishments and our achievements. Because what happens is that when you see your accomplishments and achievements, you begin to walk in an attitude of pride and arrogance. Oh, and you don't want to go down there. Pride and arrogance, you know, I didn't realize in 2017, one of my spiritual sons said to me, he said to me, the, 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 the devil wants to sift you, but Jesus says, I got your back. I thought, wow, that's good. I wish I'd gone and read the scripture. I probably wouldn't have gone through as much pain as I did. Because right there it says, Jesus said to Simon Peter, the devil is seeking permission to sift you as wheat. In other words, he doesn't get his permission from God. He gets his permission from you. Come on. And so, doesn't it say in Peter that the devil goes around like a seeking? You see, I didn't realize that, that my accomplishments gave me a sense of arrogance, pride, know-it-all attitude. And I would walk into churches and immediately begin to look at them and poop all this and poop all that because, hey... An amazing church, campuses, buzzing, good income. God says, hmm, I'm going to have to do some sifting. And let me tell you, I'd rather be sifted by God than be sifted by the devil. The devil is cruel. And that's one of the messages that I preach. I said, I forgive you, but I really want to thank you. Because in the pain that I realized I was going through, God reminded me that I'm not yet dead. We say, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. Yes, until that first air and that first stab and that first emotional ripping your guts out. And then you suddenly think, man, 
haven't quite died yet. For me, this finding focus was such a turning point for my life. Because I didn't realize how alive I was to the flesh and how dead I was to the Spirit. Thank God for His grace. Jesus said, I'm praying for you that when... I'm praying for your faith that when you have overcome, you will encourage your brothers. I am grateful for whatever God is doing. I really am. I walk into churches now, and I just, I am so grateful. I say, oh, God, this is amazing. When I walk out, I think, oh, God, this is amazing. Look what you have done. Not look what Jerry has done. That's why to throw up the numbers and to throw up this and to throw up that is self-glorification of man's achievement and ability. But let's talk about the exploits of God. Let's talk about the work that Jesus has done. Let's celebrate him. Amen. Amen. And so when you do that journey, and he says, he says, do not call to, and it's amazing how you want to recall. I used to, when we travel in America, we'd always tell about what we did in Bristol. I don't do that anymore. Because what you see in Houston, some Sunday nights I've got up and preached my heart out to six people. Because God had to deal with some pride and arrogance. (laughs) Hello, are you out there? Do you understand? He had to do some peeling away of flesh. I would say, Lord, send me a worship team. He says, you are the worship team until I send somebody. Okay. It's like Wayne said the other day, they're working me overtime. They work me overtime. I mow the lawn, I cut the grass, I wash the steeple, I change the light bulbs, I kill the ants, I put on weed killer, I, hello, are you out there? Yeah. God says, there's <laughs> a time that I need to scrape you a little bit, but I thank God that I've been scraped good. I'm just grateful for whatever God, wherever God puts me. And even now, you know, when that turning point came, we now have a worship team that side. While I was away, I saw we, we had an additional drummer. We got a piano player. We got a bass player. We got a drummer. We got singers. Hey, Amen. We got children church workers. I got overseers. I'm, people that are in the church, they're preaching up. I don't have to import somebody to come and do it. And the church is alive and well and prospering and thriving. Amen. Without my permission, but His. That's what's happening here. Without my permission, but His. Are you getting this? So what does it mean? 2017 was the fulfillment of 20 years vision. Given to me in March 97 to cover our city, bless our neighbor. It was also the year that Houston began to function. Go to the next slide. What happened? In 27, we launched the new leadership structure here in Bristol. Three overseers to run with a vision here and help the church function as a voice in the city. It was also the year that brought about great changes in leadership, ministry, and saw people launching out into ministry and others leaving for one reason or another. So what can we conclude Amen. What can we conclude about this? Well, it was very unsettling time, but it was all good because the word says in Romans 8, 28, verses 31, and we know that God causes all things, come on, read it with me, all things to work together for good to those who love God, 
to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Conformed to the image of his Son. Say that with me. Conformed to the image of his Son. God is perfecting His Son in us. If your focus is not on the Son of God. Are you out there? Crisis. Challenges. All kinds of stuff will happen to you. Because you've moved out of the umbrella. You know, there's a message I did um, recently, and I might have even done it here. It says, you can dance in a hurricane as long as you're standing in the eye. You can dance in a hurricane as long as you're standing. And you know what? In the middle of the hurricane, it's very peaceful. You can't even hear what's going on outside there. But just move a fraction out from the eye, and all hell breaks loose in your life. I want to dance in the eye. I want to be in a place of safety and security. Amen. So in 2017, if you go to the next slide, I know. So what did God say in 2017? And this was community. The church is a community of people who share common beliefs and practices under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and in accordance with the Word of God that reach out to the community of the world with the love of God. The Apostle Paul said he became all things to all men that he may win some over to Christ. Our mission field is the United Kingdom. That is our mission field. And we cannot be demissive of the people or their ways of life if we desire to reach them. Jesus said for us to make disciples of all nations. In the light of his instructions, the importance of our discipleship process must be accentuated. That's what he said in 2017. Amen. If you go to the next slide, it says, what did God say in 2017? Acts 2 verse 42 to 47, it says, They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer. Day by day, continue with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord and the Lord. And the Lord, come on, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day to those who were being saved. Amen. Amen. And so it talks about four things. And, and just for lack of time, we might uh, just skip those slides. Maybe go to the next one. I don't know. Um, the community in the book of Acts, to establish a Christian community, there are four foundational beliefs that need to be implemented and practiced on a daily basis, which was the apostle doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Building the community, establishing what is the apostle doctrine. The apostle doctrine is talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Teaching people, making disciples, you know. Fellowship. The Holy Spirit creates a spiritual union by melting and molding the hearts. This is going to be put in a little booklet for you anyway, and you can see all the scriptures and read it for you. Believers, it says the Holy Spirit creates a spiritual union by melting and molding the hearts of Christian believers to the hearts of other believers. He attaches the life of one believer to the lives of other believers. Through the Spirit of God, believers become one in life and purpose. They have a joint sharing their blessings and needs and gifts together. That's the purpose of the church. Amen. You see, whatever you define, you divide. And that's why the Apostle Paul challenged the church in Corinth. He says, one says I'm of Apollos, one says I'm of Paul. And he says, you're still carnal. I can't talk to you as spiritual people. Why? Because we, we start naming and we start um, form, formulating our little preferences instead of staying with the body of Christ and staying as a unity in communion. 
The Lord's Supper or breaking of bread was one of the ordinances of Christ that given to symbolize his death. And it was the death that saved them. Because of his death, they were now reconciled to God in fellowship with God and made new creatures in God, for, in fold with the Spirit of God and bearing all the fruit of the Spirit. Prayer is the basis of intimacy that helps build a Christian community. Prayer and confession go together, declaring the end from the beginning and establishing vision and salvation. Amen. And we go on to what we pray for. Amen. Where are we? Are you keeping up with me, champ? Okay. So let, get, go to the slide that says how to get involved. Just go and find the slide that says how to get involved. Anyway, we, I did this on a key point, on, on key, uh, anyway, and I had to translate it, so not all the slides. So here's the thing, how to get involved. Find the slide that says how to get involved. Keep going. So the first thing, how to get involved, is share your faith and your story is the power of salvation. It's just gone totally ballistic. Just go out of it, Rob, and then find that how to get involved and then just bring it up because it's just, there you go. I mean, we don't have to see you doing it, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. Uh, no, let me, let me just say this to you. Let me say this to you. Five years ago. <laughs> hey, Mary. And Mary recognized five years ago, hey, they would have been dead at the back there. <laughs> so God must be doing something, eh, Mary? Hey, yeah. Georgie? <laughs> hey, man, I'm not fussed about those things anymore. I don't care, you know, if we have one magician or we have a whole orchestra. Yeah. You know what? It's not the amount of musicians that usher in the presence of God. It's the hunger of the people to receive from God. Amen. I don't fuss about those things anymore. Where are you? Have you found it yet? Okay. Anyway, it's how to get involved. Love you, Rob. But Rob watches me on, on Periscope. He says, man, he says, the cameras should make you look fat over there and skinny over here. I said, thank you. That's a wonderful compliment. Thank you, Rob. But, you know. Amen. Amen. So, key, finding focus and... Okay, we, we way past that, Rob. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway, just turn it off and put the camera on me and let me just look, look at the thing. And I'll just read it out to the people. Yes. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think I'm a, 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 a little better position, a better position. Anyway, how to get involved. Here's the key. There's five things that you can do. Number one, share your faith. Your story is the power of salvation. Do you understand that the gospel is your story? It's the good news. That's how we build community. That's how we find focus again. Because what we're looking for is we're looking for entertainment so that our flesh can be pacified instead of using the, the very story of our born again experience and sharing it with other people. You see, nobody can diminish the power of your story and your testimony. You know, just now when I was ministering in Durban, um, I just got up and I started sharing how God brought us to faith and, and how praying in the Holy Ghost helped us bring healing to our marriage and everything else. And it was amazing, the power of that story, how it ministered to the lives of the people, that the altar was just full of people. The power of your testimony glorifies the work of the Spirit in your life. You see, people can dispute and argue Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but they can't argue Nigel, Rhea, and Bob, and Mary. Because it was your living experience. It's your story. And the power of God. They can't come and say, well, God, Jesus doesn't live in you. How do you know? Have you got a nice idea? You can see inside me. I know Jesus lives in me. Absent from the body is present with the Lord. So go and preach the gospel to all the world. That's what Jesus said. And so often we think, I've got to have all this amazing knowledge to go and debate people. God did. Jesus didn't say go into all the world and debate. 
So go in all the world and preach. Tell your story. That's how you get people to come to church. Because when they see the change in you, they're curious. How come you like you are? I want to go and find out who it is that's doing all that to you. Number two, second one. Invite people to your home and to your church. This is what Pastor Em was saying. It's important. Invite people. Fellowship is the basis of increase. Notice, they says they went from house to house and God added. How did he add? Through invitation, inviting people to your house. If people will not come to your church if they don't first come to your house. Yeah. Come on. Oh, that went down like a lead balloon. I'll say that again. People will not come to your, your, your house. Um, your, okay, help me. People will not come to your church if you don't invite them to your house. It's in your house that you share the testimony. It's in your house that you bring them to a deeper, more intimate relationship with you and then with the Christ you serve. That will encourage them that when you invite them to come to church, they will feel that they're already have family there, and they will come and be with you. Yes. Amen? Amen. Mm. Number three, do not forsake the gathering of the saints. It's critical. This is how you get equipped with the Word of God. You grow in faith and in leadership, and you grow in the sense of the presence of God. Do you know that the Holy Spirit has given gifts and the Holy Spirit wants your gift to function and operate in the body so that we can all be encouraged and grow together. Amen? Amen? Amen. We all have a gift. How many of you know that you have a gift? When, when Jesus lives inside of you, you have everything that you need to function in his body. See, the Spirit of God was talking to us this morning. I don't know if many of you recognize that. That is because if that gift was not, let's just use Gaynor for instance. If Gaynor did not come to church, we would not have known about the rivers of living water. But now, the very fact that she came, the gift confirmed. Yeah. I stand, come on, Jeremiah, I stand over my to perform it. Are you getting this? And so thank God for the gifts. Thank God we can't do this on our, by ourselves. We've got to do it together in the body of Christ. Amen. Amen. And just by the way, I just heard this recently. One of the prophets said this. He says, the final, this great move that is about to hit the church is going to come about through the baby boomers and the millennials. I said, yes. Amen. Why? Because the baby boomers have walked through an experience that the millennials want to know about. That's why your testimony is so powerful. Baby boomers. Amen. We, we grew up in a world, or we grew up in a world where there was no sense of entitlement. The only thing you were entitled to was a smack in your head. Amen. The wonderful things my mother taught me, you know. If you're going to kill each other, go and do it outside. I've just swept the floors. <laughs> you know. Do you understand? <laughs> yeah. And I've got a whole bunch of them, the things my mother taught me. Do you understand? And so there's a baby boomer where we didn't have all the social structures that give us a sense of entitlement, we had to push in and have a real encounter with God. The millennials are desiring that encounter of God. But what we're giving them is we're giving them cake instead of giving them the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Yeah. It's like that woman, the queen of whatever in France when the, the, the revolution came about. Huh? Mario Antoinette. When they said, there is no bread in the marketplace, she says, give them cake. <laughs> they didn't want cake. They wanted bread. Hence, she lost her head. And I'm prophetic, and I didn't even know that I was so pathetic. Uh, 
So do not forsake. Here's number number four. Practice the presence of God. Practice the presence. You, you find your fit and serve the Lord by serving others. There's always a place for you to serve in the family of God. That's what we do. We practice the presence of God. When we come together, we are practicing the presence of God. We serve one another. We find out all the issues that we are carrying within us, all the prejudice, because when we only want to serve certain people and we want to create our little sect and our little clan together, we realize that we have not yet fully died to the things of God. And we need to get into more of the presence of God. Hello? And then number five, the God of the tithe is your key to protection and prosperity. Just recently, I heard a tremendous testimony of Mark Barkley. Pastor Mark Barkley has a church. His wife last year was diagnosed with, I think, stage three or stage four cancer. They gave her months to live. And he walked out of the, the doctor's room with his wife, and they went and sat in the car. And they looked at each other, and they said, whose report will we believe? They told her all the different things that she would need to do to maybe survive another three months, six months. And he went before God and he says, Lord, you're the God of the tithe. I'm a tither. You said in your word. You said in your word, you're the God of the tithe. And you said, no sickness will come now my dwelling place. You will open up the windows of heaven. You will pour out a blessing upon me. You will keep my family and you'll keep it because you're the God of Of the tithe. And I've honored you from day one with my tithe. And now I petition you on the basis of you said, test me. Test me. They went back three months later and they couldn't find one ounce of cancer in her. She went through no, yes, praise the God, praise the Lord. The story doesn't end there. Their, grand, their granddaughter fell into a swimming pool and drowned and was without oxygen for 30 minutes or something without oxygen before they pulled her out. She was completely blue. Took her to the hospital and they said, if she comes round, it's a miracle. But if she does come round, she's a vegetable. He took his wife and took his daughter Son-in-law went outside and said, we're petitioning the God of the tithe. See, people don't understand. When people poo-paw this aspect of tithe, but when you have a revelation of who you're in relationship with, and what that relationship means to you. That's why when I say to people, bring all, when God says, bring all the tithe, that there may be food in my house. And test me now to see. And he said, now, Lord, they said, but you're the God of the tithe. You said you would open up the windows of heaven. You said you will cause a blessing. You said that nothing will come nigh my dwelling place. You rebuke the devourer. The suddenly, the little girl starts breathing. The suddenly. They put her in the induced coma because they're now trying to work through things. And eventually she comes out of the coma. Perfect. Nothing wrong. Because of the God of the tithe. You see, when you debate the word of God and you question the power and the presence of God, God says, why do you dishonor me? You bring second-hand gifts. You bring second-hand things. Just bring and test me and see if I will not do it for you. Amen. Amen. So finding focus in 2020 is once again finding our relationship and intimacy with God. Bringing us back into the position of God. Life is a journey, faith is a vehicle, love is the fuel, so together we can enjoy the journey. So Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, since we are surrounded 
by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, every sin that so easily, and let us run with patience and endurance the race set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. If I can encourage you anything about vision for this year, get back to the place of intimacy with Jesus. God bless you.